Hello, I'm Catherine. I'm a woman with Asperger syndrome and I've always been fascinated with toilets. I thought I'd make a short film about the various types of toilets which I remember, going back to childhood. It would be difficult to find all these toilets in the field now, as it were, so I've made my own 3D pictures of them. This film is only amateur, doesn't claim to be historically accurate, or complete. I just made it for my own enjoyment and I hope that you might find some memories here to enjoy too. The house I grew up in in West London was an early 1930s semi. It had an outside toilet, plus an inside toilet in the bathroom. The outside toilet had a white porcelain pan and a cast iron, high-level, well-bottomed cistern. For anyone who doesn't remember, these cisterns had to be painted. Ordinary household paint left over from any other decorating job would be used for this purpose. The toilet in our upstairs bathroom also had a cast iron, well-bottomed cistern originally, painted pale yellow to match the yellow painted wooden toilet seat. However, this rusted through in the late 1960s, so Dad had it replaced with a more modern well-bottomed cistern, which came in a black, rubberized material. These dauntless rubber lye cisterns were quite common at the time. A few years later, the cast iron cistern in our outside toilet also failed. The plumber replaced it with a very smart, modern-looking white plastic cistern. It always amused Dad that the name on the circular red badge on this tank read, Centurion. One point to note here is that a toilet which was separate from the bathroom had been and still was very popular architecturally. Many 1930s semis which didn't have an outside toilet had an upstairs toilet which was separate from the bathroom. In the late 1960s to early 1970s, most toilets of my acquaintance still had high-level cisterns. Sanitary wear was almost invariably white. However, colored porcelain did exist. The first example of this which I remember was in the semi next to ours. Our neighbors in the adjoining semi had had an extension to the back of their house in around 1960, giving space for an enlarged upstairs bathroom and a separate toilet. Their bath and sink were colored lilac, but the toilet was a low-level, close-coupled version in pale pink. It had a side flush lever, which I could never get to flush properly. In fact, low-level cisterns had been around for some decades. In London, domestic water other than that for drinking was commonly supplied from a header tank. A good number of maisonettes were built from the 1930s onwards. As these frequently had header tanks sited below ceiling level, a lower level cistern provided a more efficient gravitational feed. These low level tanks would be in porcelain, with a pipe connection to a wash down pan. Likewise, houses built throughout the 1940s and 50s would sometimes have a low level toilet with a porcelain cistern, or would perhaps have had their old high level cistern swapped for one of these later on. Note that these low level cisterns, as opposed to close coupled varieties, were invariably in white porcelain. My recollection of toilets isn't just restricted to those in the home. My primary school had been built in 1960, so the children's toilets had plastic high-level cisterns at a child-friendly height, with plastic chain pulls. These are the girls' toilets, which also contained the large sluice sink which was used by the cleaners. The boys' toilets were much the same, except that they contained urinals instead of the sluice. Both sets of toilets also had hard, shiny toilet paper instead of the soft, absorbent paper which most people had at home. This paper was hopeless for toilet use, but made excellent tracing paper. Another 1960s to 70s toilet recollection is of those on trains, as we often went on day trips by train when I was young. My earliest memory of train toilets is that they were in a primrose yellow color with brown wooden seats and lids. I think that these toilets were in British Rail Mark 1 coaches but I am quite happy to be corrected if you know better. During this same period, plastic was becoming ubiquitous in the home and elsewhere. Consequently, dual-height plastic cisterns became common. They could be used at a high level with a chain, as in the earlier example of my school toilets, or at a low level with a shorter downpipe and a flush handle. As they were suitable for left or right hand use, these cisterns would normally have a round blanking plate on the unused side. These plates very often had the name of the manufacturer or the name of the model on them, or both. By the early 1970s, sanitary wear was available in many different colors, the most popular being pastel shades. It would have been impractical for these plastic cisterns to be issued in every shade. Therefore, they came in black or white only. 
One popular cistern of the time was the Shire's Lynx. Here is a lookalike I've made connected to a pale turquoise toilet pan. You might also notice that in those days there was no attempt to hide any pipe work. Feeder pipes like this copper one were on view, as was the cistern overflow pipe, which led to and overflowed to the outside of the house. Another popular cistern was the Dudley Tri Shell, as shown here on a pale green toilet pan. During the 1970s, many people who lived in older homes were having their high level cisterns replaced with low level versions like this. You'll see that the toilet seat also has on it one of those 1970s favorites the fluffy seat cover. However, there was a common problem which arose for many people who wanted to swap their high level cistern for a low level one. Simply, because a high level configuration only required clearance for a pipe behind the toilet pan, the pan would be too close to the wall to allow placement of a low level cistern without blocking the seat. The answer was ingenious. Cue the iconic Ford Amp flush panel. This ultra slim line white plastic cistern fitted where other low level tanks wouldn't. It saved even more space in that instead of having a protruding flush handle, it had a chromed plastic flush button on the top of the cistern. This button invariably made a curious wheezing sound when depressed, but the flush was pretty impressive, as I remember. The flush panel was so popular that it was later manufactured in other sanitary wear colors as well as white. Public toilets in the 1960s and 70s were still of the penny in the slot variety. If you don't remember these public conveniences, as they were called, they had heavy wooden doors with a large brass box at handle height. To access the toilet, it was necessary to place a penny coin in the slot, and slide the knob to open the door. I was frightened of getting stuck behind these heavy doors, but they fascinated me. It was like opening a box of assorted chocolates, you never knew what you were going to find inside. On a more serious note, the money collected helped to pay for maintenance and the attendance wages. As the 1970s wore on, closed coupled toilets began to feature much more commonly in domestic settings. The earlier pastel colors started to compete with much stronger shades of sanitary wear. There was a real explosion of color during this period. Oranges and browns were popular in 1970s decorating schemes, as shown here. Another color whose popularity continued well into the 1980s was the now much disparaged avocado. I did actually have a suite in this color in a flat which I owned myself. It's sad to think that this once loved color currently features on estate agents lists of things which most put prospective vendors off from purchasing. I mentioned earlier that unlocking the door of a penny in the slot public convenience was like opening a box of chocolates in toilet terms. In the 1960s and 70s, the variety usually revolved around what kind of high-level cistern would be found and what kind of toilet seat there would be. But, as the 20th century entered its final quarter, it was very exciting just to visit the toilets in other people's homes, as every bathroom would have a different colored suite from the next. I collected all these colors in my head, and thanks to the internet, I can still find many of them today. At the end of this film, there's a video catalog of 33 of the most popular colors of sanitary wear. All the toilets we've looked at so far have had one thing in common. That is, the pan is fixed to the floor. The first wall-mounted toilet pans I came across were those in motorway service stations, which are extremely busy. These pans appear to be quite gravity-defying, as no part of them touches the floor. However, they are of course firmly fixed to the wall behind them with bolts and a frame. These toilets commonly come with a concealed cistern hidden behind the wall, with only the flush handle visible. The advantage of toilets like this in high-volume use applications is obviously that they are much easier and quicker to clean. Briefly, let me return to a train theme, to show another toilet which utilizes the back-to-wall configuration, again for ease of cleaning. This is an example of a toilet on a modern train, the Class 390 or Pendolino. Unlike other toilets we've looked at, this one is manufactured in vandal-proof stainless steel. Whilst wall-mounted toilet pans have never caught on in a huge way in domestic situations, the concealed cistern became more common in the 1980s, and is still found today. This gives a pleasing streamlined appearance, but can have disadvantages if an access door isn't fitted. I once lived in a flat which had a cistern concealed behind a fully tiled wall. This was fine until it began leaking. The plumber fixed the problem easily, but the patent tiles he removed had been discontinued leaving my bathroom wall with mismatched tiles. In the 1990s, 
there was a general backlash against the excesses of the 80s, which applied to sanitary wear as well as everything else. The once vivid colors became more muted again, with paler, more neutral colors coming into favor. However, two hangovers from the 1980s were the continued popularity of bathroom carpet, no matter how unhygienic, and the temptation to add a touch of blig in the form of gold-colored metal wear on taps, toilet flush and other accessories. As the last decade of the 20th century neared its end, even the subtle colors were gradually paling into white. White became the color of choice for new and replacement toilets, sinks and baths. Additionally, the default style of toilet was now the close-coupled version. The 21st century dawned and the popularity of white sanitary wear continued. It soon became a generality that one could buy any color of ceramic as long as it was white. Anything else was considered to be in bad taste, and colored wear began to disappear from people's houses. In parallel, white became the sole color available in mainstream DIY and bathroom stores. Something else was happening during this period. Close coupled systems with flush handles were becoming less common, and were being replaced by systems with a lid top push button action, such as the one in this picture. Initially this appeared to be a just another fashion led design fad but it continued, albeit with toilets in slightly different shapes and orientations. There was a very good reason for this. In the 21st century, ecological concerns came to the fore, along with the need to conserve water. Toilet-wise, this had already been happening during the previous century. The original 9-litre systems had been reduced to 7.5 and 7-litre size. Now it was seen as important to reduce this still further. To do this, some more design tweaks had to be made. Firstly, push-button systems with dual flush action appeared, and these are now standard. Our picture here is of a square version of the white push-button system toilet. This differs from others only in shape. Secondly, it was considered important to revise the internal shape of the toilet pan. Originally, toilet pans had been of the standard wash-down variety, as I've already mentioned. However, in the 1960s, Pans with a cephoic action had been introduced, to ameliorate any lack of flushing power from a close coupled system. These pans would present with a fairly high water level in them, forming a bowl shape. Upon flushing, the contents of the pan would be sucked out through the U-bend and soil stack, before being replaced with fresh water. However, in practice, the toilet paper and other solids would frequently just swirl around in the pan. The millennial answer to the toilet pan problem was this. The lower volume of water in the system could be compensated for by reducing the size and clearance of the base of the pan. If you're dubious about this, just go to your local DIY store, lift up the lids on the push button toilets displayed, and take a look. The illustration here is of a push button toilet with a space saving corner orientation, featuring a triangular system. Nevertheless, the volume of water in the system is as standard, usually 6 or even 5 liters, and internally, the pan has the same small base and low height clearance. Now here's the trouble with today's standard modern toilets. The low volume flush and limited clearance frequently results in solids becoming lodged at the bottom of the pan. At best, the toilet has to be flushed a number of times to clear the waste. This means that paradoxically, far more water is actually being used than was previously the case. However, a worse scenario can and does occur. The toilet becomes completely blocked and requires the owner, or maybe even a plumber to rod it and unblock it. Not surprisingly, few people will admit to having this problem with their toilet although there's quite a bit of discussion about it online. So, what's the answer? Well, other kinds of toilet are still available, even from many DIY stores and plumbers merchants. Modern versions of the high-level system can be found, which are coupled with a wash-down pan. The most common of these systems are streamlined versions in white porcelain, as shown in this picture. However, reproductions of old-fashioned systems are also made by specialist manufacturers. These range from the cast-iron well-bottomed systems of my childhood, through to the earlier ones with a wooden surround or with overhead armature. Famous names such as Thomas Crapper are still celebrated on some of the systems. Additionally, high-level plastic systems are still manufactured, mainly aimed at the commercial market. All these new versions of the high-level tank conform to modern plumbing standards, despite their retro looks. For those who are seriously into vintage, old and reconditioned toilet systems and parts are available on the internet. As far as I'm concerned, the high-level toilet is the ultimate, the creme de la creme of toilets. 
but, sometimes they just can't be fitted. When I moved to my current flat, a close coupled toilet with push-button system had recently been installed incorrectly by the previous owner, and was completely ineffective. In fact, I had to keep a bucket next to it until I could get a plumber to install a new toilet. Of course, I asked the plumber for a toilet with a high-level system. To my disappointment, this wasn't possible, as my bathroom only has plasterboard walls. A high-level system could only be installed by demolishing the wall and putting a supporting frame behind it, which would have been too expensive. So, I went for a compromise, which you can see in this picture. This is the other alternative to the close coupled toilet, a low-level system with flush handle and downpipe, connecting to a wash-down pan. I think it looks quite smart, and the best thing is, it actually works. That brings my tale of toilets pretty much up to date, except for introducing here the promised catalogue of formerly popular sanitary wear colours. A recent conversation with a young woman in her early 20s inspired this colour catalogue. Quite simply, she had no idea that coloured porcelain used to exist, as she'd never come across it anywhere. This made me wonder whether fashion will cycle back at some time, and people will once again embrace colours in their bathroom. In the meantime, for those who want to make a style statement, or who still have a colored suite with damaged items that need replacing there are still companies who pledge to supply as many different colors and styles as possible. A brief search on the internet might surprise you and even inspire you.